Um, to switch gears, we would like to uh, show you one of the use cases as a demo. Uh, my colleague Ajit will show that before that, uh, I would like to answer some of the miscellaneous questions and uh, summarize what we did today. So uh, one of the things Shaji didn't show was the SKU list and how we sell this today, right? So we have essentially uh, uh, three basic SKUs and uh, we also have the service provider SKU which we haven't listed here. So as you see here, we, the, the enterprise SKU is geared towards the, the 1G platforms and the, the, the starting line and, uh, <clears throat> and the DC IP base essentially is the, the basic layer two, layer three functionality geared towards uh, data center applications. Uh, this can very well do all the uh, basic DC applications and uh, VXLAN included here. And also we have the DC MPLS SKU which covers all the MPLS uh, which the platforms can support. So that's a quick, uh, I just wanted to mention that. And then uh, let's move on to the, to the demo. Uh, so we, what we are trying to show today is uh, one segment of the uh, DCA applications. <clears throat> so we have a complete uh, uh, DCA setup here. Of course, we have limited nodes and resources as you can imagine, but uh, we have uh, simulated couple of uh, data center uh, geographies and then we are showing the the part which interconnects and we are using VPLS and uh, uh, MPLST to showcase this. So again to recap, uh, let me quickly recap the, the the solutions which we covered today on both the OFNOS and the VERNOS. So some of you are wondering what is, uh, I mean there are many NOS vendors today and more will come for sure. So what is our key differentiation uh, as we speak today, right? So. One thing which customers appreciate is the, not only the breadth of solutions, but the, uh, the completeness of solutions in terms of the physical solution, in terms of OCNOS for white box, and VERNOS for the NFV. So we are probably one of the few vendors, or probably uh, one of the very few number vendors who can do both the solutions. And some of our customers in Europe have chosen as precisely for this reason. Uh, you don't want your, uh, you don't want different OS running in your NFV side and on the physical side and, and on the core side. So you typically, for the OPEX reasons, you want to have familiarity and use similar OS. So let's quickly look at the, the three main solutions we do today, right? So one is the, uh, the data center. So here we do the traditional L3 class and the multi-tenant data center using VXLAN. And then, of course, we have the v DCI solution using... VPLS, uh, and we can do also L3 DCI. And uh, the other solution which we talked about is the internet exchange point. So again, we can do two types of uh, solutions here. One is the L2 interconnect, and uh, this is the solution which uh, Lynx is using today and uh, or, or under <coughs> deployment. And uh, the other one is the L3 interconnect using MPBGP. And uh, the other use case which we are currently uh, ramping up and lots of POCs going on with telcos is the service provider use case. Again, the kind of uh, uh, solutions we discussed are the edge aggregation, career ethernet, and so on, and subscriber management. So <clears throat> this is how a, a snapshot of our solution matrix. Again, all these are geared with, uh, uh, implemented using Broadcom chipset for obvious reasons, market driven, and so on. And, uh, but we are working with other uh, chipsets uh, as we speak, and uh, <clears throat> so to recap, these are the Verna solutions, the the CEP solutions, and the service provider and controller applications. <clears throat> so uh, in the next couple of slides, I will quickly uh, mention our DC L3 class use case. So this is a standard uh, L3 BGP use case uh, for your tar leaf spine uh, data center. And uh, in this use case, uh, so this is a more expanded architecture uh, uh, deployment scenario where we have uh, simulated this use case. So as you can see, uh, all these nodes from the TAR to the, the spine run the L3 BGP. In fact, eBGP, uh, this is modeled after the Lakupov draft and, uh, and we, we, we can also do uh, BGP, eVPN, VXLAN for the L2 extension and uh, and as well as, of course, v VLANs. Uh, I mean, I, I won't go into the details of this demo. We have a webinar based out of this demo. 
but what we are going to focus today is uh, on the DCI van. Uh, so we have the gateway routers here and uh, how do you interconnect uh, multiple data centers reliably is, is what our focus today. And uh, <clears throat> so this is again uh, some configurations for the um, L3 data center solution based on NetConf. So maybe I can just uh, quickly show you uh, how our NetConf interface looks like. So this is very standard uh, uh, NetConf configuration of BGP peers and, uh, and also some of the BGP attributes like multipath and so on. So um, as we have talked about, we, we do Ansible and NetConf and of course uh, REST. So uh, for this demo, for the webinar, we have used uh, primarily NetConf and CLI for the, the L3 uh, class webinar. So, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, for lack of time, let me hand it over to Ajit and Sai. Since ICCP is forming a redundancy group between PE1 and PE2, uh, the moment PE node PE1 goes off, the other PE becomes uh, active for both VLANs or both VPLS instances. So in that way, we make sure that at the node uh, at the edge, we have a node level redundancy. So even in case if there is a link, so and we are using uh, RSVP TE uh, with FRR. So we provide both uh, link level protection as well as node level protection. So in case if there is a node level failure at any of the P nodes, we have a redundant path and it doesn't take, it, it takes some 50 milliseconds to recover. So we don't give that, uh, we don't need that protocol convergence to happen so that uh, you go through an alternate path. So using RSVPT, uh, we provide both one-to-one uh, -one protection as well as one-to-one -one faculty protection. So for this particular demo, uh, we are using one-to-one -one protection where we are using RSVPT to provide the MPLS transport path and on top of that, we are uh, running the targeted LDP uh, to provide the VPLS end-to-end. -end. Yeah. This is a sample configuration. Uh, if you see, uh, it's a typical, uh, it looks more like, a, so this is a CLI configuration. It's a command line based configuration where uh, we, are kind, uh, we are creating a OSPF uh, network. Then we are adding the MPLS configuration where uh, we enable RSVP on all the network ports. So in that topology, so in this topology, so on the network ports, which are typically these three links, we are enabling the RSVP and MPLS. So are we looking at the quote unquote standard CLI right now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's, a, it's a standard CLI. Right. So currently all the nodes were configured with the standard CLI. Yeah. Uh, we do have a netconf. Very, yeah, very familiar, but I, I had to ask. Yeah. So. And uh, if you see the RSVP, since we are using the transport path, so we are kind of creating the primary paths. So we have kind of uh, three paths, typically from all the way from PE1 to all the remaining nodes. So we have a primary path from PE1 to PE3, PE1 to PE2, similarly PE1. So that's the primary path. Uh, since we are not configuring any secondary path, by default, the detour path is automatically calculated by the RSVPT. And uh, if you see, this is how we enable node protection and link protection. And we map saying that this is the primary path which you need to take to reach a particular destination peer. So once RSVP is up, it brings up the LSPs uh, between all the PE nodes with both node level protection as well as the link level protection. Once that is done, we uh, use uh, targeted LDP. Uh, so we support even BGP for uh, VPLS. In this particular scenario, we are using a targeted LDP because uh, interchassis communication protocol works actually on top of LDP. So it's not a separate protocol altogether. So in order to provide a provider edge redundancy, so we need to actually use uh, targeted LDP. And if you see the ICCP configuration, so so typically, we are creating two VPLS instances uh, with neighbors as uh, PE3 and PE4 in the topology. So if, in, if you see the topology, uh, on PE1, we kind of, uh, we create two VPLS instances, VPLS red and VPLS blue, just to name it, uh, where in this case, uh, the destination pairs are PE3 and PE4. Because PE2 is uh, the same ICCP redundancy group, we don't need to create any VPLS instances with PE2. 
So, if you see, uh, for VPL is red on PE one, I'm making uh, role as primary, the other role as secondary. So, we see PE two's configuration. Typically, it will be opposite, where the same thing for VPL is red. The role will be secondary, and the role will be primary. So. We are kind of using active standby mechanism where uh, we are, so where we are dividing the VLANs, I mean we are, VLAN, because since it's a typical L2 protocol, uh, what I mean to say is L2 VPN services which we are providing. So we are uh, dividing the VLANs. So for example, we are mapping VLAN 2 to VPLS red and VLAN 3 to VPLS blue. So this is what the actual configuration uh, So, I mean, if you see the CLI, it's, it, it's a typical, uh, you can say Cisco-based, Cisco-like kind of CLI. Uh, so, these are the RSVP sessions actually, so I think. Green size, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you see, uh, we have both primary as well as detour. So if you, uh, for the same P, so uh, the primary, uh, so we named it such a way that so that it will be easy to understand. So in this case, uh, this particular LSP, uh, this is the actual primary path to reach uh, from uh, 888, which is the PE4 all the way to PE1. So we are in PE1. So these are uh, egress RSVP. Yes, yes, this is the egress RSVP. For example, this is the MPLS forwarding table, which where we have all the FTN IDs, uh, I mean, paths to reach the destination. For example, to reach PE2, this is for the paths to reach uh, PE3, paths to reach PE4. Yeah, I mean, typical XIA. So, all the way from the gateway, right? So, typically, so using XIA actually we are pumping the traffic. We'll bring that back. Yeah. So that X, interface. XIA is actually connected all the way to gateway and we are kind of uh, receiving the traffic on the other side. So it's a typical, uh, so we just want to show uh, the recovery mechanism. So. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that interface you just had up there a second good question. ago? Though? I was thinking the same. What 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 is that GUI that we're looking yeah. at? Which one? Uh, that's the Ixia. Ixia, that's, that's Ixia. Ixia. Okay. <clears throat> the Explorer, Ixia. Explorer. Which we're uh, familiar IX with. That's why yeah, we were, yeah. what's, what are we looking at? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's IX Networks. Okay. Where we are kind okay. of pumping no, the that's, traffic. That's fine. No, yeah, that's fine. So, what I'm doing is in P3, uh, I'll do a link level fade. So, the traffic is actually flowing from gateway one all the way to gateway two. So, it, so one of the middle nodes was PE3. So, we'll just check the traffic. Well, while you're doing that, can I um, ask a question slash comment? So we, I mean, Which also one? most of us here know how to configure a router. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to shut down a link. That's fine, that's fine. But yeah. I was really wondering with regard to programmability, okay. which is what a lot of us are seeing. Okay. Spending less time on a CLI. Okay. We brought up NetConf a few times, that yep. kind of thing. Yep. You know, the whole DevOps uh, uh, paradigm. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, for the NetConf part, uh, so currently, uh, it's not actually supported in Ocnos. Mm -hmm. It's supported in, uh, we have a different pipeline called XP, right? So it's supported yeah. in XP. So currently we are running Ocnos on a Trident 2 boxes. So we don't have a NetConf support for MPLS in Ocnos. Okay. But it's, it's supported in XP. Uh, so since we don't have a NetConf uh, 
what you say, uh, to kind of do a, this is a basic operation where you do a shutdown of an interface. Yeah, yeah. But uh, since we don't, we don't have a way to show all these MPLS counters and all the FTN entries, right? So for now, we kind of ended up using a simple command line. Yeah, which is fine, you know. I, yeah. That's, okay. I gotcha. So the oh. netconf is support for the other SKUs, the yeah. DC, IP base, and the enterprise, but not for MPLS yet. Yeah, understood. Will be really understood. For large scale topologies, right, we do provide um, Ansible scripts, mm -hmm. which you can basically execute from OpenStack. Right. And typically you would have a plugin that goes into something like ODL, for instance. And uh, ODL basically would have a module, which would be the netconf, and then a netconf client. So essentially that gets translated as a netconf um, call. And our server basically gets that netconf document. It parses it. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is it calls pretty much the same CLI, uh, same API that mm -hmm. the CLI is calling. Yeah. Right? So it is calling that netconf plugin that is sitting on top of the CML engine that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Yep. OK. Just wanted to make a, a comment about the CLI. I'm, I'm pleased to see that, that uh, 95, maybe 99% of the network engineers on the enterprise field will be um, won't be lost if they had to touch that kind of software hardware. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's uh, that's a really good point, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that that goes back to the point I was making earlier, right? It's, since it's a model-driven architecture, the, we can also generate uh, Juniper-like CLI because yep. we we have had customers in the past ask yep. us. That. So you are saying that if um, if somebody is buying your software, you can adapt the CLI as they wish. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Uh, because um, that that is one of the key pieces why we have a model driven architecture, right? So, so a very quick point. One of the largest social network, right? They they said they still use CLI because uh, if you have a multi vendor environment, you cannot debug everything using all the standard interfaces. Yeah. So for whether we like or not, we are going to live with CLI for a while. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's mm. well, realistically, if you're talking about making a move toward the enterprise, going down into that realm. I, I don't know if we necessarily see you know, a widespread adoption of network automation like you would in the service provider or web scale mm -hmm. companies yeah. where it makes a lot more sense. But even in the even Some in might the disagree market. with me. So, yeah. you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. E even in the SDN market today where, pe where other vendors have highly automated mm -hmm. platforms where they mm -hmm. technically say you don't have to touch it, you still end up in the CLI for yeah. troubleshooting yeah. at yeah. some point. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it yes. it's never going to go away, and I think that taking it away, you'll lose traction with a lot of professionals who yeah. yep. want yeah. the ability to get down in the weeds if they need to. Yeah. So yeah. keeping it there is a good move. Well, and their premise is you don't have to touch it. It means you have to touch it heavily architecturally, but after you've done all the work, then you don't have to touch it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But when you when something goes wrong, you may need it as a backup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 